So, here I am in St Thomas's recording our second video sermon. Of course, you can watch this wherever you like, but you may want to save it for Sunday morning and watch in solidarity with church family and Christians around the world who are facing similar restrictions on gathering together. I've made a few suggestions for worshipping at home in the weekly news sheet, live streamed on online material, the BBC's provision, or creative DIY worship. And we'd love to hear what works for you so you can share good ideas over the coming weeks, particularly for families. Well, what a week of contrasts it's been. We've basked in glorious spring sunshine while the world faces a major health emergency. Some have already been touched directly by the spread of coronavirus. To others, it's all a bit unreal. For some, the restrictions imposed on us have been a minor inconvenience or even a welcome holiday, while for others, it's brought anxiety about health, family, work, finance and future. A crisis brings out the best and worst in human nature. On the one hand, our heroic healthcare workers, national and local government working flat out to adapt, volunteers assisting self-isolating and vulnerable neighbours. And on the other hand, panic buying, people risking the safety of others, ignoring guidance, and criminals finding new ways to exploit the situation. The Gospel reading for today, Passion Sunday, is also one of stark contrasts between life and death, grief and joy. It's the story of the raising of Lazarus, who was the brother of Martha and Mary and Jesus' close friend. It comes in John chapter 11, verses 1 to 45, and Janet is now going to come and read it to us. Thank you, Janet. John 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick, he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you were going back. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Let's pray the Collect for Passion Sunday. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Quiz lovers will instantly respond, John 11:35. Jesus wept. But why did Jesus weep when he knew Lazarus was about to be raised from the dead? Because he was deeply moved by the grief of the two sisters. I haven't been called on to conduct a funeral since the current crisis began but it's likely to happen, and when it does, I'll try and let you know through our confidential prayer channels, because those are going to be very difficult services, with only one or two close relatives able to go to the creme or graveside. Those restrictions are absolutely necessary, but are bound to add another layer of trauma for bereaved families. So Jesus' compassion for Martha and Mary is evident, but there's something else. Knowing that resurrection was to follow didn't erase the fact of death. Just as we do, Jesus felt the wrongness, loss and separation 
which death brings. It casts a long shadow over those it touches, as the 23rd Psalm reminds us. Paul calls it the last enemy, an enemy yet to be destroyed. Perhaps the deep unease many of us feel at present is because the shadow of death has fallen over the developed nations in a way that hasn't happened since the last war. In many parts of the world, they live daily with the reality of death, and this epidemic is just one more challenge to contend with. But it hasn't been like that here. Death has been hidden away and sanitized. The reality now is that people are dying. More people will die, and some of us may, although thankfully for most, that's a pretty remote possibility. I don't know about you, but all that has given me a couple of restless nights, a vague feeling of anxiety and unease I couldn't put my finger on. A while back, I wrote a short tongue-in-cheek essay arguing against the widespread Christian belief that death is nothing at all and that fearing it is simply a lack of faith. I won't weary you with that now. I can email it to anyone who'd like to read it. But I can't resist one quote from Woody Allen. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. Fear of death is a reality we have to confront. Jesus experienced it in the Garden of Gethsemane, and here in John 11, he feels the wrongness and grief of his friend's death. As I said last week, if you're feeling worried about all this, don't beat yourself up. Those are natural feelings. It helps to recognize where they're coming from, and give yourself time to process them. For some, the loneliness of self-isolation or social distancing is another kind of death with its own feelings of grief and loss. Others have very real worries about, the, about their job, family, finances and future. This is a time to be kind to one another and ourselves. The Church of England has produced some meditations to aid good mental health, which you can find on the Church of England website. Holy Week, just over a week away, is traditionally a time when Christians reflect on the suffering of Jesus as he entered into our universal experience of death. Maybe that will have particular resonance this year, not just for us, but for people with little or no Christian roots. I'm thinking of setting up our big wooden cross in the car park at St Thomas's, where people walk through for their daily exercise, with an invitation to pause and pray, and maybe even pin a prayer request on it. Perhaps we'll leave some palm crosses for them to take too. Thinking aloud, I wonder if we could do something similar at Holy Trinity and St John's, though I'm not sure what Kingfisher could do. So Jesus wept because he empathised with Martha and Mary's grief and because he felt the reality and bitterness of death himself. But he also had something to say to the sisters which went way beyond that. Verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. 
Death may be all too real, but it doesn't have the last word. To everyone's astonishment, Lazarus comes out of his grave, just as Jesus will a few months later. Easter follows Good Friday. Life conquers death. Hope overcomes fear. I am the resurrection and the life. The more I think about it, the more outrageous that Christian hope seems. We have the audacity to claim death is defeated and eternity's door stands wide open. Now, we mustn't be arrogant about that or dismissive of people who struggle to accept it, but simply humbly share this outrageous hope. Not that we've somehow overcome that fearful enemy called death, but that Jesus has. As some of you know, West Ashton has a lovely tradition that throughout Lent, a large wooden cross stands in the middle of the church. During Holy Week, other symbols of the Passion are added. Large six-inch nails, the whip Jesus was scourged with, and the 30 pieces of silver Judas was paid to betray him. Then on Easter Sunday, the cross, the cross is covered with oasis, and as we come to receive communion, we're invited to decorate it with spring flowers. By the end of the service, the cross that had stood bare for six weeks has blossomed. It's a moving and visual symbol of the reality of the death of Jesus and the reality of his resurrection. The reality of our death and our resurrection. Again, I'm thinking aloud, but I wonder if we could do something like that outside our churches where people walk past. The shadow of death has come a bit closer this year than we used to. Too close for comfort. But death doesn't have the last word. Coronavirus doesn't have the last word. Cancer doesn't have the last word. Mental illness doesn't have the last word. Fear doesn't have the last word. Jesus does. Paul put it like this. If Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Let's pray that somehow, as a consequence of what we're going through, that message will be heard louder and clearer this Easter, through online stuff, the broadcast media, personal, personal conversations on every digital platform imaginable, by people who wouldn't even have been in the churches if they had been open. Wouldn't that be just like God? to use this crisis for good, to turn a curse into a blessing, fear into hope, and death into life. If you know it, you might like to join me in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for all those who've been touched by coronavirus, those who are ill or have lost loved ones, and those who care for them. We pray for protection and peace for frontline healthcare workers, some known to us as they daily put themselves at risk for others, and for those seeking effective treatments. We ask for healing for the Prime Minister and other ministers who have fallen ill, and for continuing wisdom and strength in the huge responsibilities they bear. We pray too for the Queen and Prince Philip, for whom this must be an anxious time, and for Prince Charles as he recovers from the virus. And we pray for all who are finding the restrictions placed on us hard, mentally, emotionally, or physically. And for those who are now worried about their future income or how to put food on the table. We thank you for the swift response of government, NHS, farmers and shops to put in place measures which keep us safe and provided for, and for the many local acts of kindness triggered by this crisis. We give you thanks for the beautiful spring weather this week, which has lifted our spirits at a difficult time, and for all the benefits we still enjoy in this country. Most of all, we give thanks for Jesus and the victory he's won over sickness and death and for the hope we have in him. Lord, please turn this crisis into good. Let many hear the message of Holy Week and Easter as a result through electronic media and local initiative. Let your kingdom come and hope triumph over fear and despair. Amen. And finally, pray with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, now and always. Amen.